Hey, this is a video on T.S. Eliot and his early poems. Are you ready to talk about him? T.S. Eliot was born in 1888 and uh, lived up to 1965. As everybody knows, he was a poet, critic and playwright, a pioneer of the modernist movement. Though experimental in writing, he was very conservative in political and religious views. He has said this famously. I am a classicist in literature, Anglo-Catholic in religion and uh, conservative in politics. He edited the periodical The Criterion where The Wasteland was first published. He got the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1948. As again you might know, he was born in America, in St. Louis, in Missouri. And his family originally came from New England sometime in the 17th century. New England is the northeast part of the American continent. Uh, sorry, uh, the 17th century ancestors came from England and settled down in New England. And uh, that from that time, they had lived in New England and then they later lived in uh, Missouri, etc. So the 17th century ancestor came from East Coca in Somerset. In one of his poems, East Coca, uh, T.S. Eliot talks about that place. Eliot went to Harvard University, that was in 1906, and there his teachers included the philosopher George Santayana and Irving Babbitt. They were very important thinkers and writers of that time and influenced Eliot in different ways. Babbitt especially influenced his idea of the dynamic relationship between past and present. Irving Babbitt influenced Eliot's idea of the dynamic relationship between past and present. What do you mean by dynamic relationship? That means not only does the past influence the present, the present also influences the past. That is what he says in Tradition and the Individual Talent. That essay we will deal with in detail uh, later. Now, uh, Eliot also had a very uh, great bias against uh, Romanticism. He did not appreciate romantic poetry. He was a modernist anyways. And uh, this bias of Eliot against Romanticism also was inherited from Irving Babbitt. And uh, uh, Eliot had an interest in Dante, Jules Laforge. He was a French symbolist and other symbolists like Baudelaire. These influences can be seen in Eliot's poetry, including the Wasteland. In this video, I am talking about the early poems up to the Wasteland. Uh, not, not only up to the Wasteland, other than the Wasteland, I should say. Uh, Eliot's poems other than the Wasteland. Um, now, Eliot did his formal studies in philosophy. And he wrote a thesis that was eventually published as Knowledge and Experience in the Philosophy of F.H. Bradley. And Eliot, unfortunately, did not take a doctoral degree, but that doesn't really matter. It does not the degree that you hold that really matters. What you are is what matters. Now, his early career in England after he emigrated. Uh, Eliot left America in 1914 and settled down in London. And uh, at this time, he, had a he was married to Vivian Hayward. It was a troubled marriage from 1915 to the early 1930s. And Vivian... Uh, went mad and they were separated and uh, when she was ill and dying in hospital, Eliot did not even visit her, it seems. You know, such things are there. Eventually, Eliot remarried a second time uh, to Valerie Fletcher. Uh, that was in 1957 and it was recently that she passed away in the 21st century. Uh, he served a short term as assistant editor of The Egoist. The Egoist was a very popular periodical a literary journal of this time and Eliot for some time was the assistant editor of the Egoist and then he became the editor of the new quarterly review the criterion from the beginning of its publication from the first edition uh, sorry first issue to the last uh, until it ceased the publication it was Eliot who was the editor he also worked as a director of Faber and Faber. Faber and Faber is a very uh, famous publishing company 
and Elliot worked as the director there. And Valerie Fletcher, his second wife, he met there. He helped many younger poets in their careers to publish. At this time, he was a patron of the younger poets. And he began to publish poetry with the encouragement of Ezra Pound. Remember, Ezra Pound was a very important figure at this time. And Ezra Pound um, f discovered Eliot's talents in some ways and also uh, edited the Wasteland. The early career of uh, Eliot in England continues. Eliot's influences uh, were the French symbolists like Baudelaire and Laforge. Uh, ah, the Simmons book, The Symbolist Movement in Literature, was a very important book at this time. A lot of people, including Eliot and WBH, were influenced by it. Ah, the Simmons introduced French symbolism into literature. French symbolism can be legitimately called the beginning of modernism at this time. And it was Ah, the Simmons' book, The Symbolist Movement in Literature, that introduced symbolism into England. The American new humanists like Irving Babbitt and Paul Elmer Moore, we have already seen, influenced Eliot. Irving Babbitt was a new humanist in America, along with Paul Elmer Moore. F.R. Leavis was the first critic who recognized the genius of T.S. Eliot. F.R. Uh, Leavis was a contemporary and a critic of the wasteland, and he um, appreciated, along with the other new critics, F.R. Lewis also appreciated the genius of, ways, uh, of the wasteland as well as its author. Now, poems up to the wasteland. The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. That is one of his earliest uh, publications. It was written while he was a student at Oxford University. And uh, it appeared in 1915 in the American magazine Poetry. I have already talked about the magazine Poetry and its um, oh, publisher and its editor uh, in the uh, uh, video on Ezra Pound. It was a very major poetry magazine at this time. Um, and the Poetry Foundation of today is uh, publishing Poetry Magazine. In his first volume, Prufrock and Other Observations, also it was reprinted. So, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock uh, was uh, first published in Poetry Magazine and then in Prufrock and Other Observations. It was initially considered shocking and offensive. Uh, but later, the genius of the poem was recognized. There were two more collections. In 1919, which is the year of publication of Tradition and the Individual Talent, came a collection of poems. And uh, it was printed by Leonard and Virginia Woolf at Hogarth Press. And it contained the poem Gerontian. Uh, Gerontian appeared uh, with an epigraph from Shakespeare's play, Measure for Measure. Uh, start... Uh, Starting, thou hast nor youth nor age. It should be starting. Uh, so this is the epigraph of Gerontian. We will talk about this poem Gerontian uh, eventually at the end, of, uh, towards the end of this lecture. Now, uh, after love song, uh, Gerontian offers the mental impressions of an elderly man. Gerontius, uh, if you know, is Latin for old man. And Gerontian means little elderly man. Ara Vos Prek is a book that people may not have heard of very much, but that was a second collection from 1920, collection of poetry. Now, I'm not going to talk about the wasteland now, but at the end uh, of these early poems came the wasteland. I will just introduce it here and then deal with in detail in another um, couple of videos. The Wasteland was published in 1922, the same year as uh, James Joyce's Ulysses, as well as uh, uh, Jacob's Room by Virginia Woolf. The Wasteland was published in the first issue of the Criterion, as I told you already, and it was dedicated to Ezra Pound in acknowledgement of his editorial role. Uh, Eliot acknowledges Pound as the better craftsman or Il Miglior Fabro. There was a controversy over its innovatory technique and pessimistic tone. Uh, people thought that it is a too depressing and pessimistic poem. They did not appreciate it. People were in two minds. They didn't know what to think of this unconventional poem. And it came to be accepted as a central text of modernism. The Wasteland became a central text of modernism. 
Now, let us come to the poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. It is a poem where uh, a character, a modern man, like you or me or anybody, uh, just an every man in the modern period, he is pondering over the nature of his existence. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Look at this title. The Love Song uh, suggests an amorous uh, theme. It is probably about somebody's love. And look at this Alfred Prufrock. Very silly name. A very, uh, you know, insignificant name. And also very self-obsessed person he must be because he says J. Alfred Prufrock. When somebody asks your name, you should not say Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so or Dr. So-and-so or don't say your name with initials. All that is considered a little self-obsessed. So here is Alfred Prufrock and the title of the uh, poem is J. Alfred Prufrock, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. What is funny is, uh, you know, this is not a man of any significance. He is just an ordinary man and uh, he is a failure in life. But the title makes it look like it is some grand story of his life. Now, he is actually a tragic comic figure. He is not a great heroic figure or anything. He is a tragic comic figure and he is of uncertain age. We don't know what age he is in. And uh, this poem is an examination of the tortured psyche of the prototypical modern man. Uh, 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 an examination of the tortured psyche of the prototypical modern man. And uh, this man uh, is overeducated. He is eloquent, neurotic and very anti-heroic. Uh, this is a painfully self-conscious monologue spoken by this man as he goes through the um, streets of London and uh, he is probably going to meet a woman uh, friend and uh, he is unable to make a declaration of love to her. Um, he just spends his life doing meaningless activities, not able to do uh, anything or achieve anything. That kind of a failed character this is. And uh, proof rock uh, proof rock, proof rock, if you repeatedly say the word, you will get the feeling that it means proof and rock. Proof, P-R-O-O-F and R-O-C-K. Proof rock is another word for touchstone. And uh, J. Alfred Proof Rock is like a touchstone for modern man. He is like the uh, modern man. So this name is a variant, a, a pun on the other word for touchstone also. Now, this is uh, an allusion to Jules Laforge's self-mocking little man. Jules Laforge, the uh, French symbolist, talked about a, a very insignificant little man in his poems with self-mockery. And this uh, element has been used by T.S. Eliot in this poem as well. Proof Rock seems to be addressing a potential lover, but he does not dare to ap approach the woman. And in his mind, he hears the comments that others make about his inadequacies. He is not able to uh, overcome the fear of society and what others will think about him. If you read the poem closely and think about it, you will see that there is a Proof Rock in all of us. We are all such characters who cannot uh, live confidently and who are scared of what others will think and who are always trying to um, live up to somebody else's expectations and be something that we are not. So that is the malady of modernity and that is what uh, Proof Rock represents. He chides himself for presuming emotional interaction could be possible at all. He is very shy of communicating with people and he is very self-conscious and unheroic. And uh, he uh, lives in a uh, you know, fantasy. Uh, there is no reality uh, that the fantasy represents. And uh, in such a world, there is no possibility of emotional interaction at all or intimacy at all. Now, this is very true in modern societies in the West where there are no arranged marriages and there are no families to support you. Um, if you are smart and good at something and you are pleasing in your behavior, etc., then you will get boyfriends and girlfriends and then you will get partners and get married and all that, have a family. But if you are no good, if nobody will want you. Um, if you are not smart and if you are not uh, good at anything and if you are just, what can I say, a wimp, you know, diary of the wimpy kid, yeah, that wimp, 
well, nobody will want you. You will not get anybody to love you or you will be lonely. And a lot of people in the West are lonely like that. They go out of their mind sometimes. They start talking to themselves and they act weird. They become eccentric and eventually sometimes even mad. So this kind of isolation and loneliness uh, is very characteristic of Western metropolitan societies, even in the time of uh, T.S. Eliot and very much so today also. But today, because of other distractions like the internet and other things, probably uh, the nature of the loneliness is different. But there are many metropolitan societies where people do not have anybody to talk to. They live alone. They have um, they have to live from hand to mouth, making their own money and just absolutely meaningless lives without emotional interaction or intimacy with anybody. So that is a Western malady, uh, so to say. Now, uh, the style of the poem is a variation of the dramatic monologue. As I already mentioned, this man's monologue it is. Uh, there is an epigraph from Dante's Inferno, which is a very significant epigraph. Uh, it, par it is the parallel of a tormented sufferer in personal hell. In uh, Dante's Inferno, there is a man who is uh, suffering in hell. This man, Dante, knew um, a little bit. Uh, he, he was an acquaintance. This was a very famous warrior, actually, the man who is speaking the uh, epigraph. He was a count, uh, Guido Montefeltro. And uh, you know why he is in uh, hell? He is, Dante is meeting him in hell. Why is he in hell? Because he gave wrong advice to the Pope of that time. And uh, when Dante meets him in hell, Dante asks him, why are you here? Uh, oh my God, you're here. Why are you here? And you should be in heaven. And then the Count who is in hell speaks this line. If I thought my reply would be to one who would ever return to the world, this flame would shake no more. But as no one ever returns alive from this depth, if what I hear is true, I answer you without fear of disgrace. That means I'm sure he's telling Dante. I'm sure, Dante, that you're not going back to the world from hell because nobody ever goes back. Because you're not going back to the world. You won't be able to tell anybody about my plight in heaven. So I'll tell you my story without fear of disgrace. Now, why is this the epigraph? Because the uh, speaker, uh, Alfred Prufrock, is actually telling the reader, reader, you're also in this hell with me and you're not getting out of it. So let me tell you my story without fear of disgrace. You, reader, is in this poem. You are part of this hell that Prufrock belongs to. Did you understand? Right. So it uh, this describes, this epigraph describes Prufrock's ideal listener who is as lost as the speaker and will never betray to the world the content of Prufrock's present confessions. Even if he wants to, he cannot tell anybody because he's not going out. He's not getting out of here. And uh, this poem is a carefully structured amalgamation of poetic forms. It is not just one I'm Big Pandameter or anything. It is a careful amalgamation of different, different poetic forms resembling free verse at the end. And it uses refrains. There are repetitive lines, many lines that are, that are repeated, many phrases that are repeated. Presenting the consciousness of a modern neurotic individual. Like mad, he is repeating to himself. He is talking to himself and repeating words and phrases to himself. The poem also contains absurd rhymes, suggesting that Prufrock is capable of neither love nor sacrifice. The, uh, the, the metaphors used here, the similes, the um, rhymes are all kind of absurd. Famously, uh, in this poem, fog. Uh, is compared to a lazing cat. Uh, then there is the image of an insect stuck on a pin, a crab deep in the sea, scuttling the floors of the sea. So, so many uh, striking images, but all conveying a sense of absurdity. And also rhythms are insistent, like incantations, like uh, chants of mantras or some uh, tribal, you know, chants. 
the insistent rhymes repeatedly same rhythm uh, and rhyme coming again and again and again as if it is like a mantra which is uh, supposed to uh, save uh, proof rock from this predicament but it's not really going to save anybody it suggests a ritualistic approach to a climax this is a life without a climax this life of proof rock will only peter out it is just going to die out whimper to die with a whimper rather than a bang eliot said that idea elsewhere the world ends with a whimper not with a bang you know like that proof rock's life will also end with a whimper and it is only in the poem that there is a ritualistic approach to a climax and uh, in this poem there are many lines that are uh, quoted and uh, the, the, the often quoted and i have suggest, i have put some of the excerpts from the poem here let us take a look at them let us go then you and i he is talking to somebody probably to himself probably this you and i are both two sides of himself <laughs> uh probably uh, you and i is the reader and the uh, speaker you know uh, it is ambivalent it is not clear who is this you and i let us go then you and i when he is so lonely he is probably imagining that there is somebody with him which has a christian connotation the belief that christ is walking beside you so let us go then you and i uh probably two sides of his personality schizophrenic personality then there is a very famous conceit when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table like a patient who is given anesthesia and he is lying on the table and very soon he'll be operated upon and there will be blood on his body you can imagine like that the color of the sky is the color of the sky is uh pale red and orange and multicolored the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table that is a uh, an indication of a uh, sterile world of a world where nothing happens uh, it, it it is a it is like a fantastic fantasy a fantastic world etc and in the room the women come and go talking of michelangelo this is repeated what are the women doing talking of michelangelo again that uh, suggests a kind of absurdity and um, i have measured out my life with coffee spoons some people are like that they'll go to coffee cafe uh, co coffee shops and sit with their partners or friends and then more and more coffee measuring out their life with coffee spoons nothing ever gets done only conversations only uh, meaningless encounters nothing really gets done life doesn't go on so this happens to many of us also at many points in our life i have measured out my life with coffee spoons no i am not prince hamlet nor was meant to be i'm an attendant lord one that will do to swell a progress start a scene or two advise the prince he is not the hero he is not the main character he is an attendant lord one that an extra one that will do to start a scene or two or advise the prince in his life he is not the main character <laughs> well i am reminded of david copperfield david copperfield uh, begins like this whether i will be the hero of my story this i am going to tell my story but whether i will be the hero of my story or somebody else will take that position these pages will show <laughs> how can somebody else be the hero of your story it can be if you are not in control of yourself if you are not a master of your life if you let other people command you and control you and if you do not have a personality if you're like a j alfred prufrock it can be so uh, j alfred prufrock is not the main actor he is just an extra i grow old i grow old i shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled again that is an example for an absurd rhyme and uh, there is he is a young man but in modern life you can see very often that even in a young age old age sets in even in your youth old age will set in you become tired in the mind you do not know uh, where your life is leading you don't you have lost the energy and passion see so that is uh, conveyed through these 
lines. I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trou trousers rolled. All these uh, sum up Prue Frog's dull life and dull days that are meaningless. Uh, his, uh, you know, desperation and self-consciousness. There is so much uh, trivia in this poem. Very insignificant details given about eating and dressing. And uh, very soon, uh, Prue Frock leaves the fantasy of meeting this woman and professing his love to her, etc. And drowns. Like in the wasteland, drowns, fear death by water. How does he drown? Not in real uh, ocean, but in the social world in which he flounders. He doesn't belong there to that social world. He doesn't have anything to do there. But he just goes into the crowd and he uh, drowns in the crowd. He becomes a nobody in the crowd. So I found this picture in the internet of... Somebody standing and looking at the sky and I thought this kind of summarizes and provides a proper end to the discussion of this poem. Now let us uh, talk about Jeronshin. Before Jeronshin, there are a few other poems I would let just passingly mention. One is the portrait of a lady where uh, there is a younger man talking about in three episodes uh, a, an older woman who is trying to get his love. But this young man does not love her. He keeps meeting her, but there is no uh, fulfillment uh, of love coming out of their encounters. This reminds us of scenes in the wasteland. And uh, this uh, title reminds us of uh, Henry James's uh, portrait of a lady. Uh, a lot of Jamesian elements can be found in Eliot. Henry James's influence is very great in um, Eliot. And then uh, Eliot also, some of his other early poems include uh, preludes, which are uh, pictures of modern city life. Preludes, they are called. Uh, within preludes, uh, there, is, uh, there are a number of poems that present different scenes from modern life. Then Rhapsody on a Windy Night, that is uh, a poem that, that is written about night, between midnight and four in the morning, and the narrator is wandering the streets and talking to us about his memories, etc. It was in Poems 1920, if you remember, that Jeronshin was published. It had a, a number of major uh, poems, that uh, collection, uh, such as uh, the Hippopotamus, where uh, the church is compared to a hippopotamus. That is a very important poem, uh, etc. And uh, Jeronshin is a meditative monologue of an elderly man, a little elderly man, Jeronshin, as I told you. He is meditating on his past, his uh, personal law, feelings of loss and on general decay of humanity also. Personal to the general. Uh, a dramatic interior monologue in six stanzas that presents the mental impressions of a little elderly man as a young boy reads to him. Uh, he has a very bleak, negative vision, but he is not completely negative. It is not a total despair that you find in the poem. There are some um, rays of hope as well. The title Geronshian brings to mind the dream of Geronshius. If you know literary history thoroughly, you will know that Cardinal John Henry Newman wrote The Dream of Geronshius, which is uh, about a, a, an old man. And uh, from there, uh, probably Eliot drew the title Geronshian. And this is another proof rock, but an older proof rock. Another failure, another modern man who has nothing to do in life, but he is much older. And here, as I told you earlier, the epigraph is taken from measure for measure. I said that in an earlier slide. And the epigraph also suggests a life that is not fully lived. <laughs> So that is the epigraph. The beginning, uh, opening of the epigraph is Thou hast nor youth nor age. Remember that. And it is one of the wasteland cycle of poems. There are, there are a group of poems called the wasteland poems. They are uh, Geronshian, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, the wasteland itself, uh, the hollow men, etc. Uh, throughout Geronshian, you find the fusion uh, of 
human human individuals individuals and humanity the fusion of past and present the fusion of meanings sometimes fuse um you know ideas dissolving into one another this technique that eliot developed in jerontian he further develops in the wasteland the wasteland also uh, employs this cinematographic technique of dissolve that is a technique in uh, cinematography now like the month of may in which the poem is set jerontian's mind is also dry and sterile uh remember the wasteland was set in april and jerontian is set in may and uh, may is a dry month and jerontian's mind is also like the month dry and sterile thus he prefigures the fisher king of the wasteland the fragmentary nature of his mind is reflected in the discordant collage like form of the poem the poem has a collage like form uh, it is very fragmentary and uh, without any continuous flow and that actually reflects the state of his mind his mind is also like that intertwined here in the poem are jerontian's personal reverie i already mentioned this personal moving towards the general and there are also fragments from the bible from shakespeare from ben johnson from george chapman and numerous other elizabethan and jacobian writers you should understand that eliot was deeply influenced by the jacobian writers and he was a student of the jacobian writers he employed them uh, very much in their writing especially in the wasteland and quotations from the jacobian writers are found in jerontian as well there are also less uh, reflections on the lessons of human history and on christ who's compared to a tiger as in blake several times you can see uh, elements of blake also in t s eliot so reflections on human history and christ okay there are a few more other early poems the hippopotamus which i already mentioned is a satirical poem where the hippo is compared to the church it is the first of the quatrain poems eliot used the quatrain stanzaic form in many poems at this time he took it from theophile gautier the french writer uh whispers of immortality is another quatrain poem linking sex and death In the first part of the poem he pays homage to Jacobian masters whom Eliot admired like Dunn and Webster and in the second part of the poem he describes a Russian temptress called Grishkin so sex is reduced to temptation and sterility here that is the meaning and death Sweeney among the nightingales is another important poem a poem in quatrains again with an epigraph taken from the play agamemnon sweeney is an ape like modern character modern man he appears in the wasteland as well as in the play uh, sweeney agonistus he is a lusty man full of wine and laughter and his life is marked by spiritual barrenness the scene is a pub where two ladies are trying to seduce sweeney and they seem to be plotting against his life the poem ends with a reference to the song of the nightingales eternal song of the nightingales these nightingales sang when agamemnon was also killed now also they are singing not only singing but also excreting that is mentioned and this song of the nightingales at the end is only a prelude to his absurd meaningless murder sweeney will be murdered but it has no meaning it is meaningless compared to the great murders of the mythological past so this poem ends in a uh, has a mock heroic tone the poem has a mock heroic tone okay so that brings us to the end of the early poems next will be the wasteland which will be another video thank you very much i hope you enjoyed